I'm not on. Not that it matters in here a whole lot, but yeah, I, I am on. on. Oh, okay, I'm on. Sure, great. Um, um, hope, hope you're doing well today. today. Good, Good to, to see, see everybody. everybody. Welcome. And we look forward to what the Lord has for us today. It's, it is a beautiful morning. I think it is anyway. It's a um, breeze, sun shining. It is a nice day out there today. And, but it's great to be inside here. It's nice and cool this morning as well. So uh, appreciate you being here. Look forward to what the Lord has for us this morning as we continue our study. Um, in the Sermon on the Mount, we're coming to a little bit of a conclusion. And so we're looking forward to that today. But uh, we're going to begin our service with a word of prayer. We'll read some verses together, and then we'll sing to the Lord today. And I appreciate you joining us here in person. If there's anybody watching online, thank you for joining here as well. And I pray that it be a help and encouragement to you today. But let's pray, and we'll get started this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for who you are. We're grateful that we serve a God who is high and holy and lifted up. Lord, may we worship thee with all the honor and glory that is due thee today. I'm thankful for each one who's here. And Lord, I pray your blessing and guidance and direction and encouragement be upon them. Lord, for anyone who may be watching, I pray the same. Lord, I'm not, uh, I don't know what everyone may be going through today. I pray you meet the needs and that you would use your word this morning. Use um, the encouragement and edification of other believers to, uh, that we may help each other today. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us, we pray. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing songs this morning about our worship uh, uh, to the God who is worthy of that today. And that will bring our scripture reading to Isaiah chapter number 6, one of my favorite. Uh, just views in the throne room, if you will, of God. In the midst of turmoil, in the midst of many things going on, in, in the, the midst of, of even, even our society today, we have question marks, we have chaos, we have, we have everything around us. Isaiah, in Israel, the king, when the king died, that was a big deal. And when the king died, Isaiah had a vision of God. God wasn't troubled. Now I'm not saying he, he doesn't care, but he wasn't troubled. He was in control. He is in control. He's high and he's holy. And that's the verse the passage we're going to look at this morning. And may it kind of bring our hearts together to see God high and lifted up today. So Isaiah chapter number 6, we're going to read the first four verses together this morning. Ready? Begin. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. It's amazing as we get that view of God. And may we see God for who he is, high and lifted up. It's interesting. We hear many, many, I've heard anyway, many messages preached on a few verses later. Who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here are my Lord, send me. A classic missions message. Isaiah never had that response because he wanted to or because he saw everybody else. Why did Isaiah have that response? Because he saw God for who he was. He saw us. He saw himself for his sinful condition. And he was willing to submit to who God is. When we get the view of God right, it will get the other things in our lives in proper perspective. And the first song we're going to sing is exactly that this morning. Holy, holy, holy.
is our response will be to glorify his name. We will glorify uh, shortly, of course, this morning. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. For Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness. We will worship Him alone. Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord of all the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the
um, just follow along with what we have complete in the complete in the work of mine. May take dear Lord the place of mine. Preacher, 
And what he's doing is he's giving an invitation to respond to his hearers to make a decision or a response to the message that they just heard. While here we don't always, probably rarely, give a some come forward invitation, at the end of every message I try it and bring a call to us to respond in our hearts and our minds and take action to whatever the message would be. I, and there, there are some, some messages, messages where the response is, stand in awe and see God for who he is. That's a response. I mean, if we don't apply that, that's the response. Some messages go and do that likewise. Sometimes that's the response. Sometimes the response is, woe am I, Lord, forgive me. The response to a message is different. But Jesus here is giving a response to things that he's declared. It isn't enough whenever we hear the Lord's teaching, and, and, and truthfully, um, whenever we read throughout the Scripture, just to be enamored with the ideas of Scripture, and to walk away and say, oh, that was a neat thought. That's really not enough. Sometimes we walk away in awe, so you say, well, that's similar. Okay, there, there's some passages. I'm not the guy that says um, that you have to have an action plan to every message. Sometimes um, what the passage of Scripture is, is telling us is to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes the the application, the message is go forward. You know, it's, it's something we don't know. Um, but ultimately, Jesus is not teaching in this passage. He's not preaching this message that we've spent several weeks going over. He's not preaching this message just to say, ah, well, that was good. He's calling for a verdict. There's a decision to be made, a response to be made. Jesus certainly didn't just want people to be entertained. He certainly didn't just want people to have a good time. Is there anything wrong with being entertained? No. Is there anything wrong with having a good time? No. But that wasn't his purpose. Matthew chapter 7, the text we'll read today, I believe in the way we're applying this, is as he's coming to the culmination of this message, he's giving a, a, a call to a conclusion, a call to a, a, a response. You say, well, all of that he's been teaching has been a response. He's been teaching on how we should live, but now he's calling us to put that into action. And then he's equipping us or giving us a call to whether or not we will qualify, if you will, to carry out what he's called us to do. Matthew chapter 7. We'll begin reading verse number 12, and we'll just read 12, 13, and 14. Therefore, not to reuse an old statement from the verb, but if you see, therefore, when you're reading, make sure you know what there is for. We go back. This is a call and a transition from everything he's taught. Therefore, because of what you've already heard, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leads on the line, and few there be that find it. We see here almost a call back to the Beatitudes. In, in, in the very beginning of his message, he's, he's painting the picture of what a disciple of Christ looks like. As he says uh, in, in Matthew chapter 5, blessed is the man who does all these things, who is these things. Verse 12 kind of encapsulates that a little bit. Saying, it, we know it as the golden rule. We'll look at it as the golden rule in just a little bit. But we see what a changed life truly looks like. We see that what a changed life looks like in practice through the golden rule, but is only made possible through a decision to follow Jesus through that narrow gate. We can do everything we want to do 
and then try and lift ourselves up better, to do better. But we'll fail. If we don't have a personal relationship with the Master, if we don't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we can do good all we want, but it will never be good enough. And Jesus is teaching, he's been preaching, he's been uh, instructing, and now he says, now let's see it in action. Let's see it come to be. So, the simple title this morning is, How Will You Respond? How will you respond to the message that we've been taking several months to go over? And then he concludes with a warning and an application. Um, next couple weeks to wrap up this message. Well, let's pray this morning and ask the Lord to bless our mind. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for the good time of singing, uh, fellowship one with another. Lord, we're thankful that we will and we can now glorify a thrice holy God. Praise you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, I pray that you would guide us and direct us even in this message to apply these truths to our hearts and lives properly and as you speak to our hearts help us to be attentive and obedient to you pray your blessing be upon this time in jesus name. and the next slide brings a question to you this morning at the end of his message he asked his listeners to make a decision in response to the message they just heard that's what this is about he's asking his uh his hearers to respond and, and while I have gone, gone through and, and, and asked for a response to a degree, you know, you know in, in every, every aspect, aspect, but this is backing up a little bit, looking at the big picture, Jesus is now saying, therefore, treat others as you wish to be treated. It's as simple as that makes sense. One of the most famous statements Jesus has ever made. Um, what do we call it? We call it the golden rule. So, so many, many times. times. Call, call it the golden rule. Um, why, why do we call it the golden rule? Golden, golden rule, gold, gold in English, is used to, see, to, to, to generally um, refer to something as precious. It's excellent. And, and so, so this golden, golden rule is a precious, excellent, unmeasurable true, uh, worth. It's a principle of ethics. It's, it's an, of, of a precious truth of great worth. It's a principle of conduct that all of God's children are to live by. What, what I found interesting in some of my preparation and study about this passage, I originally had planned on preaching this as two separate messages, just so you know. Um, but don't worry, I'll try not to preach two separate messages this morning. Um, you've heard that before, I know. Anyway, but what I found interesting about the passage of verse number 12 of this golden rule, this, this direct application, basically, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. It's not unique to Christianity. Um, but yet, there's something very unique about the, how the Lord stated it. And the way Jesus puts it, as opposed to the way many other religions have put the same principle. What, what does Jesus say in our language? Like, like in our modern vernacular, how, how would we say what I just read? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? That's how we kind of say it. Treat others as you want to be treated. We say it in the affirmative. We say it in the positive. How Jesus gave it to us this morning is in the positive. Throw yourself out there. And, and, and be proactive. Treat others as you want to be treated. Um, that's what sets it apart a little bit from this principle that is taught in many other world religion aspects. There's principles found in, in, uh, in Hinduism, Buddhism, some Eastern religions. The, the difference, difference between Jesus' version and what others stated it 
it is oftentimes other places in other religions you will see it stated in the negative as opposed to the positive. What do I mean by that? I came across a, a, a quote um, that's uh, accredited to Confucius himself that stated similar do not do do not to others what you would not wish to be done to yourself. It's almost a defensive way of saying it. Um, this is an apocryphal statement. The Old Testament says, do not do to anyone that uh, what you yourself would hate. Again, given to us in a negative statement. Another statement attributed to um, really, uh, actually um, an old rabbi said, what is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. All of these are good statements. All of these are true statements. But did you catch the key difference? The key difference is, if you don't want somebody to punch you, don't punch them. They're all in the negative. They're all what you don't like, don't do to somebody else. And this may sound somewhat semantic. It may sound somewhat just a, but I think it's a key difference is, instead of just don't do what you don't want done, Jesus makes it in the affirmative and says, as a Christian, as a follower, do things that you want others to do to you to them. He makes it, he puts the onus on not just stand back and be nice. He says, put yourself in an action of applying this truth. It may seem insignificant on the surface, but I think the difference is this. The negative form is an appeal to control. Basically, it is... Learn, Learn self-control and don't lash out. out. That's, That's the, the negative form of, of the golden, golden rule, rule, right? You, you want to just rear back, back and punch somebody, somebody just control. control. You, you want to just cuss someone out while driving, just, just hold it back. back. You, you wouldn't want someone to cuss you out, right? I think mean, the way Jesus switches this golden rule, switches this around, and puts it on the positive, it's, it's an appeal of love an appeal for growth. It's not just constrain yourself and not lash out. That's often how we think of it and apply it, right? You wouldn't want someone to do that to you. That's how we have to tell our kids. Would you want your brother to hit you? Don't hit your brother. You want your sister to hit you? Then don't hit your sister. But, but I, I think, think the, that's, that's how we often our mind apply this, right? Am I wrong? That's probably, that's probably how we've applied it, probably taught it a lot of times. But, but the way Jesus seemingly has stated it, and if you look in context to, to how, where it's found in this passage, it's all about the, the actions of truth and love and growth growing out of a Christian followership of Jesus. It's all in the positive. It's go do something you would rather have someone do to you in a, in a positive way. As opposed to just sit back and control yourself, dodge the punches, and don't punch back. It's more with open hands. Give unto others. It's more with love and growth. You see the change of life. You see what we've studied in Matthew chapter 5, the blessed, the, the, the Beatitudes, and you see these in action. You see the true follower of Jesus Christ. You see the light that is not hid, exhibited in the positive outflow, if you will, of the golden rule. It goes beyond any other man's teaching because instead of trying to control negative behavior, it is encouraging positive behavior motivated by love. What Jesus spoke is doing things to others proactively. 
How many times do, do Christians often stand by the wayside and just say, well, hey, at least I didn't, you know, chomp when I wanted to chomp. At least, at least they didn't go out and, and just create a scene and we pat ourselves on the back for not being the bad guy. But, but Jesus actually has called us to be the good guy. Does that make sense? The rule or principle he gave us in calling us to an action following this message applies to every area of life. What is the meaning of this of this golden rule? We see it. We all live this principle out in one way, shape, or form. We live on different planes. We live either in that do unto others before they do it unto you. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. We, we live, live unto, unto others, others as they do unto you. Right? Fine. Fine. That, that's, that's, that's the retaliation. Or we, we live, live on the third plane as do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In fact, fact look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 22. 22. It's, a, it's an outgrowth of this great commandment. So we see the golden rule we often contribute to this passage, but then we see the great commandment that Jesus commands us in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment of the law? And Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and heart, soul, and mind. Excuse me. This is the first great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Treating people the same way you want them to treat you. And he's commanding positive action. He's not just commanding a, a control of the negative, he's commanding a positive outgrowth and a positive action. How do we get there? Not on our own strength. Not on our own power. In the, in the invitation that Jesus is giving, he's giving this invitation to the saved. Then he's going to give a gospel invitation to make sure that you're saved. It's basically how many preachers give an invitation. The end of a message, you've heard the message, do this. And you can only do this as a follower of Jesus Christ. The second half of this message this morning is basically the gospel. So, and it shows that Jesus, in preaching his entire uh, one of the, the great messages that he's preached, he comes to the same conclusion that many preachers do, and I try to apply is take heed to what is said and do it. But, but no, you, you can't, can't do it on your own, apart from the power of Jesus Christ and dwelling the Spirit of God and dwelling within you. We're at right now, in this direct audience, the application to this message is for the believer. Treat people the way you want them to treat you. Think of it. If every believer alone, forget the rest of the world, if every Christian living now, what is there, what's the count up to now? Seven billion in the world? Eight. Eight, eight now? Okay. Eight billion? I would say, there's, without exaggerating, I don't know, what would you say? Close to a billion believers, probably? I think, I think it's higher, higher than we th I, think I think it's higher than we think it is. Not, not everybody looks just like us, but, but true believers in Jesus Christ, I think it's higher than we think it is. Because there's a lot more people that live around us that I believe are true believers than we 
We're not, not going to fellowship with them in the church. They may believe different tenets, but they believe in the shepherd of the Lord Jesus Christ. And especially in other parts of the world, Christianity, true Christianity is growing. We're in America, I mean, consumerism, we're not going to get all that. It's Western Christianity is failing because it's so commercial. But worldwide, I'm just saying a billion, okay? It could be 500 million. Don't quote me on the statistics. Jesus knows. Um, but... Say there's a billion people in the world who are true believers. If, if overnight we decided, decided and we woke up and said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to follow Jesus' command here. I'm going to treat others this way. If, if one billion, billion people in this world decided to start, to start practicing, practicing this principle, principle, what would that do? Think, think of the influence that true Christianity would have on a lost and dying world. world. If, if we, we as believers just treated other people the way we should treat them. We, we can, can disagree, disagree and still love. We don't, we don't condone sin, sin, but we can treat people with respect. We, we can, we can, can um, love, love our neighbor as ourselves. We, we can, can love other believers. believers. Forget, Forget everybody, everybody outside, outside the walls. What, what if churches, churches just treated each other in a church-wide setting as, as Jesus commanded us to treat? But, but how, how we apply this principle so often is in the negative. negative. I don't, I don't like, like talking, talking to them, so, so if I don't, I don't talk, talk to them, they won't talk to me. To me. Hey, that's, that'll work out. Now we're both winning. Ow. Oh. What, what are we naturally? naturally? We, we wouldn't be fighting, fighting between relatives, relatives spouses, spouses, even nations. nations. But the, the problem in our hearts, hearts the, the problem is, is that our hearts are still in darkness. We are self-centered. We, we are bent on following our own desires. Everything about this message that Jesus has preached up to this point has been about die to self, live for me, and make a difference in this world. That is what Jesus is calling us to, is a practical outgrowth of our relationship with him. Just think of what we do in our own lives. Why do we lie? Because we, we think, think we're better, better off by lying. lying. We can gain, gain benefit, benefit by it. Why, Why do we cheat? We want to make ourselves appear smarter. Generally, Generally speaking, people, people don't cheat to help somebody else. else. People, people don't lie to help somebody else. else. Sometimes we, we may try and twist it that we're helping somebody, but no. Why, Why do we steal? steal? Have something we don't have. have. We're, we're selfish. selfish. The golden rule, the principle, means that grace is to operate through our lives in every way possible. What's different here is if we apply verse 12 to our lives in a positive way and not just a negative way, it puts us out there at risk. Grace puts us, the grace of God puts us at risk rather than the object of our grace. So all of this to say, why should I put myself out there, if you will? Why? Because of therefore. Verse 12. Therefore. This, this ought, ought to be, be our lifestyle because, because of the truths Jesus has already taught. We ought to treat others as we want to be treated in what? What, 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 what have we dealt with in the last several weeks? Judging. Judging. That, that was recently. recently. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't want somebody to murder me. I'm not going to murder them. We don't, don't want somebody to be angry with us, so I'm not going to be angry with them. These are all somewhat of the negatives. But, but also, we wouldn't want somebody to lust after us, so for... We, we wouldn't want somebody to lust after, after our spouse. Um, we, we, want, so we would not want someone, someone to look at our mate, mate with lust in their hearts. hearts. I'm, see, if I read my actual notes, notes it comes out clear. For them, them were to violate the, the sanctity of our marriage, so, so we should not look with lust at another's mate and seek to violate their marriage. Verse 37 of chapter 5, we're not folks lying to us, so why should we lie to them? Every area of this can be applied that if you 
even going to be, be applying it if you want to say in the negative sense, but also in the positive sense. If, if we, we want to be peacemakers. If you want to have, have others show mercy, mercy, then we must show mercy. If we, we want, want to have, have someone care, care for us when we are hungry and thirsty, we must care for others. We, we apply the golden rule in every area of our lives. We apply it in our conversation, in and that's in our modern vernacular, vernacular conversation, in our actual speech, or we can use the old English use of conversation in our manner of life, and our, our treatment of others and how we say. Will, Will Rogers used to say, everybody, everybody likes to hear gossip unless it's about them. them. What are we speaking about? Are our words tender? Are our words compassionate? Are our words treating others the way we would like to? Sometimes we have such cutting words. We all do. But how do we treat others? This may sound like high in the sky ideals. Right? It kind of does sometimes. But it is actually the call that Christ has for us to live out our lives is to positively make a difference in this world, not just to make this world a better place, but to exhibit his grace and working in our lives as we are seeking to follow him. Sometimes we as believers, myself, I, I, I found myself in this place, I'll just hide in the corner and not take part in what is being done as opposed, as opposed to, to making a stand, stand not, not to draw, draw attention to myself, but to make a stand, stand and positively have an influence in this world. We, we isolate, isolate and insulate as opposed to engaging. Um, we, we are called to be light and darkness. darkness. What's interesting about light and darkness? darkness? If you were in a dark, dark room, room, do you notice all the rest of the darkness, darkness or do you notice the one light? You notice the one light. You don't go, oh wow, this darkness looks a little darker than that darkness. This darkness looks differently than that darkness. But if there's one single light shining, everybody like, drawn to the light. Or they would see the light. If you're a bug, you run from it. No, you go to it. Salt. You don't notice the bland taste. You notice the salty taste. Every aspect and area where we're called to be a salt or light is to be an influence in this world, and yet so often I find myself exhibiting the negative side of how we often apply the golden rule, and just simply, well, I'm not going to beat him up, as opposed to, let me go kill his wounds. We, we look at it as, I'm just going to not respond to the negative as opposed to the call that Jesus is really giving to us is to respond in the affirmative, to respond with grace and mercy and thanksgiving in our hearts. We have been commanded to be a witness, to make a difference, to apply the truths of the gospel in a positive way. The golden rule lived out in our lives is a demonstration of the grace of God in our lives. As Christ lives through us to others. This is why I think this is so important. And sometimes we can just brush it away as, as one of the little trite sayings. But the truth is, this is, this is the exhibition of the Christian life applied to uh, a lost and dying world. God understand the way I'm going to say. God has no hands, but he uses our hands. God can do whatever he wants, but he chooses to use our hands to do his work today. God can do whatever what he wants to do, but he chooses to use our feet to lead others his way. God could simply, as we looked this morning and sang of his honor and his glory and his holiness and his strength and his power and his control his sovereignty and how great he is, he could write in the sky if he wanted to. He could speak from the heavens and 
declare the gospel in the most clear way possible if he wanted to, with his own voice. But what does he do today? He chooses, he's given us his word, and he chooses to use us as instruments of his voice to tell others how he died, how he sent his son to die for our sins. God has chosen, if you will, to use us to carry out his work in this world. And if that can be summed up in the affirmative, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. The application of the first aspect of this message is everything we've heard in these last several weeks. Instead of just saying, well, I don't do the negative side, maybe we apply the positive side to that. The application of the message this morning for believers may simply be put. It's not a difficult message. It's let's seek to make a difference with the cause of Christ and the lost and dying. Why? Why is it so important that we live this way? Why is it so important that we actually have an impact and show the grace of God in our lives, show what a changed life, show what the power of the gospel, what the power of the Spirit of God can do in our lives? Why is this so important that we understand this truth and we apply it to our lives? Why? Because look at verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. It's a commandment to come into the straight gate. Why? For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many, many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. He's come to the end, and he's, he said, look, believers, followers, disciples, those who have heard, act. Why is it so important that we act? Because there's an eternity at stake. Because. Many are wandering around hopeless and helpless. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. It's easy to walk down a broad way without instruction. But if you have to find the narrow way, it's better to have a guide. God, God has left us here as the guide to lead others through that narrow way. And if we determine that we're going to hear this message, the message of Jesus, the last few chapters, and just put it in our head and don't act upon it, how are we helping others navigate? the road to life eternal. Jesus is kind of calling us all to an attentive, attentive moment here. The stakes are high. We cannot straddle the fence when it comes to Jesus. We are either saved or lost. We're saints, or the fun way of saying ain't. We're saints or we're not. He made it crystal clear. We're on the Lord's side or we're on the side of Satan. That's pretty, pretty, pretty strong, strong language, language, if you will. <laughs> there's, there's many, there's too many that want to be Christians as long as it isn't too inconvenient or if it doesn't make too much time or energy or commitment. So, so many, many in our world today believe that it doesn't matter. It is, you, you worship God, God how you wish you worship God. God. All roads lead to Rome, if you will. All roads lead to God. But, but that's, that's not true. true. You can't get on the... On the highway, you can't get out here on 290 and decide, oh, I want to go to New Hampshire today. And instead, you go east and then you hit down 395 and head to Connecticut. You're going the wrong way. You don't go east to, go to get west. You don't go north to get south. Just as it's true physically, it's also true spiritually. Where you and I or anybody else or someone listening and watching this morning end up in eternity is 
from a definite, distinct decision. What you do and where you place your faith in this world will determine forever where you spend eternity. The fact of the matter is this. All throughout Scripture, we're reminded of the theme of the brevity of life. That we will not live here forever. Man is born of woman, two days in full of trouble. Where is you not know what is your life? There's even a vapor that appears for a little while and vanishes away. For it is appointed in a man once to die, and after this is the judgment. We see time and again the reality of life and death. The reality, the reality of, of heaven, heaven and hell, hell. The, the reality, reality of eternity, eternity. and Jesus, Jesus is reminding and stating as a fact there are only two destinations. There are only two possible directions in life. This is why it's so important that we as believers practice what Jesus has instructed us. To be a light, to be salt, to live out the affirmative, not just to withhold the negative, but to live out the affirmative in our lives. Why? Because eternity is literally in the balance. There are two possible directions in life for all of us. I'm thankful that by testimony given, those in this room have trusted Christ as your personal Savior. I can't say that for sure. I, I could take your word for that, and I appreciate the, the, the ex exhibition of faithfulness in this room that, that would carry out that thought, that, that truth. But there, there may be someone who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There, there may be somebody watching this morning who does, does not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There, there is a wide, broad, spacious way that's wide open. And anything goes. You can do what you like. You can live like you want to live. There's a broad way, the Bible tells us, that leads, though, to destruction. But the broad way may be easy. It may be wide. It may be comfortable. It may be popular. It may even make sense. It's the path of, le path of least resistance. You don't, you don't have, have to humble yourself. yourself. You, don't you don't have to repent of your sins or seek forgiveness. There, there are plenty of friends and companions on this road of life. But where, where does that road lead? lead? Jesus tells us that broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. I firmly believe, unfortunately, that Across many churches, there is also a crowd that will go this way because they desired to fit in at one point and just went away. But they didn't have a true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. They never placed their faith in Christ and what he did. They think, if I just do a little bit better or I'm okay how I am. How many times have we heard the testimony of the lost? And why should I become a Christian when the people I know who go to church act nothing like me? Or act no, no different than I do. They go to church on Sunday and the rest of the week they live how I live. That harkens back to the application that we just spent some time over in the positive affirmation of the golden rule. And that if we make a difference in this world and exhibit the difference that Christ makes in our lives through a changed life, we, we will not, not give others that opportunity to blame us. us. They're, They're fully responsible themselves, themselves, but that's why it's so important. There's a narrow way, though. Narrow, narrow way means hard or difficult to answer. Narrow, narrow way is exactly the opposite of the broad way. It's a constricted way. When you walk the narrow way, we would expect some difficulty. If you're going up a path, that is narrow, you'd expect it to be tight at times. 
is the road less traveled, which means the road probably could be a little bit bumpier. It's not going to be all flattened out and smooth. Just thinking physically speaking, that if it's a literal narrow hallway, sometimes our physical bodies feel constrained. Sometimes we feel just got to squeeze through this tight way, or, or it's difficult, or there may be a claustrophobic <laughs> idea of it. But it's unpopular, it's restrictive. When we accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we, just, we don't just accept Him, we accept His way of life and what He stands for and wants from us. That's how we ought to live as believers, is to live a life that honors and glorifies the Lord. Why is this so important that we live out the golden rule? Because many are on the road to an eternity in hell apart from God. There's an eternity in heaven in the very presence of God on the other side. I don't know about you, but I would want to have the opportunity to bring as many people as I can to heaven because of the way I live my life. Again, we, we can't, can't live one way and then just keep grabbing people. Hey, come with me! It's up to me! No. But we still have an influence. We still have an opportunity to influence the lost in this world. And it's so vital we follow Jesus while here because there's a place called heaven and because there's a place called hell. The wide gate leads to destruction. And the narrow gate leads to life everlasting. Why is everything Jesus taught about hypocrisy and religion? Why is everything Jesus taught about the hypocrisy of judging? Why is everything Jesus taught about the sins of lust and, 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 and uh, lying and, and all these things and, and putting on a show and putting on airs and, and false worship? Why is all of this so important that you get it right? Because heaven and hell are in the balance. Because eternity is in the balance. Because we have an opportunity to lead others through that narrow gate, to hold up the sign this way. But if we choose not to, and if we don't live a life that others see a difference, again, Jesus makes all the difference in our lives. Are, Are we, we going, going to live, live out the, the joy, joy, the peace, the, the happiness, the, the peacefulness to, to help others find that, that way this morning? I think the practical application of really, I'm not trying to bring a little, a little bit too much. much. We've looked at so many different great truths, truths direct, direct applications and ethical things that we should live our lives and, and, and spiritual truths that we must understand and, and pictures of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We spent weeks on these, but it can be summed up to why is this so important? Jesus said it. That settles it. That, that's just, yeah, sure. But he's, he brings it down to you. Therefore, because of everything I've just preached to, preached to you, do unto others. Positively, as you have them doing to you. Why? Because there are two gates we can enter. The gate that leads to destruction and the gate that leads to life everlasting. The narrow gate may be difficult. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the door. He is the gate. He is the one through whom we must go to find this narrow gate. And that because it's so vital... We, we, mankind, people, are, are sinners. By, by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin. sin. And so death passed upon all men. Why? For all have sinned. We, we all sin, and we've come short of the glory of God. God. We, we are just going up our life on that broad road with everybody else that's leading to destruction. Jesus made a way on the cross of Calvary for us to navigate. He says, I am the way. 
There's only one way. The one way is through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. To place our faith, our trust, our dependence upon what Jesus said, that if we, the Bible says, repent of your sins, meaning, you don't, you don't have, have to try. try. Did, did I think, think of everything? Did I get it all right? Did I, did I, did I figure them all out? No, no, it means to turn from. To turn from, from dependence upon yourself. To turn from uh, dependence, dependence upon uh, your, your past, past, your goodness, or anything like that. And, and to repent and say, say the same, same thing that God says, says that they're wretched, they're vile, and that they've been forgiven by Jesus. And to understand that our faith is in what He has done. And to turn from our dependence to dependence upon Christ for salvation. And, and to follow, follow him, him through that, that narrow gate. gate. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But, but how shall they hear if we, as believers, are not there with road, road signs, signs narrow way, this, this way, way, why, why should I follow, follow him? Have you, you ever been, been someplace where, where you, you see signs, signs like, do I trust that sign? Do I, do I trust, trust those instructions? Do I, do I trust, trust the person giving me the, the, the directions? We've, We've all gone someplace. And, and you get directions from people, and then you're like, hmm. Let me ask somebody else. I don't know if I trust that guy. Do people say that about us? Jesus gave all these this message about the importance of true religion, the importance of truly following him. Why? Because eternity is in the balance. Do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Have you followed him through that narrow gate? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? And if you have, we've been commanded then, then, and equipped as well to have a positive impact on this world of doing unto others that exhibits and exemplifies what it means to be a changed person through the power of the Spirit of God, the indwelling Spirit of God, that we may live a life that honors Jesus Christ. Eternity is in the balance. Heaven or hell. May we, as believers, choose to do it in the right way to help others who are on the path of destruction find the way through that narrow gate. I mean, if you're here this morning, if you're watching this morning, and you, don't know, and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the Bible is clear. It says you're on the broad way of destruction. Many are going that way. But you don't have to. Jesus made a way. Jesus made a way to come unto him. The gospel's plain and clear for everyone. And just treating others as we want to be treated and being good to people isn't going to accomplish anything if we're good to people on the Broadway while we're headed to destruction ourselves. We must have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. And I pray today that you would trust Jesus as your personal Savior. And as a believer, then, you would choose the good. You would choose to follow Jesus and live out a life that honors and glorifies him. Let's pray this way. Our dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the message, the text you've given us today. Simple truth. Do, do unto others, others as we would have them do unto us. But Lord, may we apply this in a positive, forthright, action-oriented way. Not just a passive, negative way, but as a believer, exhibit the grace of God in our lives and the mercy of God that you've already shown to us, to others. Lord, we know eternity is in the balance. Broadway is a narrow way. May we 
live the lives you've desired, you've called us to live, not just desire, you've called us, you've commanded us to live. Shining brightly as light, influencing this world as salt. Or may we point others to thee. And Lord, I do pray for those who do not know you as your Savior. I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, you draw them unto thyself. Convict them of their sin. Show their need of a Savior. That they may place their faith and trust in thee and thee alone. And join that narrow way. Join that group on our way to heaven to be with thee. Lord, we want people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. But Lord, we want our own family. We want our own neighbors. We want our own community to know to be a part of that glorious song of worship and honor and glory to thee for all of eternity. We ask you to work in our lives for this now in Jesus' name.